I want to take a moment uh, while everybody's signing on to acknowledge uh, Nurses Week. So this is International Nurses Week and Canadian Nurses Week and we are definitely wanting to have a huge shout out uh, to all of our nurses, uh, starting with my own. So uh, especially our Sarah, who I put in our uh, Instagram and Facebook post last night. Uh, Lisa, who has now joined us, and we will be posting about her shortly as well. Diane, um, who is, has been with us uh, since the beginning. And then we have some other folks that work with us who work in a nursing type role, even though they're not uh, nurses, and that's uh, Kim, Mirandi at times, and um, Dawn, who is off and uh, um, had some personal uh, tragedy recently. So we love you all. Um, we are super honored to have the chance to work with you. You guys are all incredible women, uh, incredible colleagues and teammates. I am very, very fortunate to have you all with us. And uh, we want to just acknowledge how much you guys have done for us and for our patients and how many people are families because of you guys. So happy Nurses Week to all the nurses. I also just want to briefly take this moment to thank all the nurses at Windsor Regional Hospital in particular the operating room nurses who recently had to take care of me and then the eMERGE nurses who subsequently had to take care of me when my ureter got occluded and I had to go with the ambulance back to the ER. So uh, thank you all for everything you're doing. The frontline teams, you guys are all amazing. It's a lot of work and effort. We are very, very proud of you guys. Uh, we are very, very appreciative, and I just want you all to know how much we uh, love and admire you, and uh, thank you for everything that you do. So let's get started. So the topic this week uh, is very important because it just, just came out the other day in the journal Human Reproduction, and it's about a very long-standing controversy, so I thought it was perfect for fact or fiction. So the question is, does the use of birth control pills or contraceptive pills prior to fertility treatments actually alter your success rates in terms of outcomes, live birth rate, clinical pregnancy rate, miscarriage rates, and so on. So this has been controversial for a long time because there were studies in the past that said it was actually beneficial to be on them. Then there were studies that said it didn't make a difference. And then somebody piled all of these studies together. And when they piled all of these studies together, Together, they said, wait a minute, it actually looks in a meta-analysis done back in 2010 and then repeated in 2017 that maybe it could have an adverse impact, that it's actually a negative. The problem was the analysis was very confusing. Um, they pooled together the clinical pregnancy rate and the live birth rate instead of separating them into separate issues because they're not the same thing. Clinical pregnancy rate is when you're looking for a heartbeat on ultrasound and live birth rate is actually having a baby. So there were two very different issues that people were exploring. And then on top of that, the other thing that was really critical was that the outcomes of the studies that they were looking at and the procedures and the birth control pills and all of that stuff were very, very different. So there was not one well done sort of long study that looked at lots of patients. It was a bunch of smaller studies. And when they analyzed it, they used kind of strange methodology. So no one was really convinced that that data was correct. So the new study is called the effect of type of oral contraceptive pill and duration of use on fresh and cumulative live birth rates in IVF slash ICSI cycles. So um, this is published just this month in uh, Human Reproduction and it's part of their advanced access. So it's not even out in actual formal publication. You can only get it digitally right now. And this is free for everyone if you ever want to sign up for Human Reproduction. Um, it will likely bore you to tears unless your job is like mine. Um, but if you do like reading this stuff, by all means, it's a, a great way to learn about the frontline medicine of everything that's happening in reproduction and infertility. Okay, so this is a Spanish study. It was done in Barcelona, Spain, um, where my sister lives actually now. So hi, Venus, hope you're well. Uh, and you hopefully are asleep at this hour. Um, so it's a retrospective study. So let's deal with the main issue here. This was not a study where they were looking forward in time, which is a prospective study. And when we grade studies, 
Prospective randomized controlled trials are always the best and retrospective studies are definitely a lower level of evidence. So this is a big study and I'll get to that in a second, but it is retrospective. So they went backwards in time and looked at their data. It wasn't, hey, let's start from now and monitor what happens to all of our patients, which is the best way to do your research studies. So the time span, uh, span used was from 2009 all the way out to 2017. It was all done in one center, a university hospital in Barcelona. And they looked at patients who exclusively had undergone IVF or IVF with ICSI. So the grouping was anyone from 18 to 45 years of age undergoing their first ovarian stimulation cycle. They were using a gonadotropin releasing hormone antagonist protocol. So those of you who are in North America, that's usually going to be either uh, cetratide or orgolutran. We use a lot of cetratide. And then um, they were all included. The patients had all causes of infertility. So uh, tubal factor, male factor, endometriosis, unexplained, even diminished ovarian reserve cases and mixes of those. And they followed all of the patients out to two years past their actual cycle to see how they did and, and where all of the results were. And, and how many pregnancies that they had had and live birth and so on. So it was all based on the first pregnancy. They weren't looking for multiple pregnancies. It was time to a first pregnancy and that outcome of that first pregnancy. All of the patients got birth control pills versus the non-pill group. So there was two groups of patients, obviously. Some received it, some didn't. And the ones that did get it had it uh, for anywhere from a minimum um, time period, and I think they specified seven days, all the way out to a maximum time period that was 30 days. And they all started their stimulation five days after they had stopped the oral contraceptive pill. So those are all really important time spans and, and points. Sorry, it was uh, from 12 to 30 days, not seven to 30 days. So they started the pill 12 to 30 days before they did their cycle, and then they stopped and waited five days, and then they started their cycles right after that five day period. And they uh, focused on only two types of oral contraceptive pills. So one is what we call here Marvelon, so that contains ethanol estradiol at a 30 microgram dose, so it's like a medium dose pill. And then they used uh, desogestrel in there as well, which is the progestin at 150 micrograms. And then they used another pill, which is essentially um, Yasmin, which we really don't use very much anymore. Uh, but it is still available, and that's 30 micrograms of ethanol estradiol, and then this really neat progesterone called drospirinone, and that has uh, three milligrams of drospirinone in it, and that's a fourth generation progestin with very anti-androgenic properties, so it actually fights off some of the um, sort of testosterone and androgenic effects that many women have. It's a pill we frequently use in women with polycystic ovarian syndrome. So the only people that they excluded were patients that were going through PGTM, which is when you're doing pre-implantation genetic screening uh, for a monogenic disorder or PGTA. So all the patients that actually were freezing immediately their embryos because they were doing genetic screening, um, the ones that were just doing egg donors or uh, social egg freezing. So those patients were excluded and that makes sense, but they included everybody else. Okay, so uh, what did they look at? Well. Um, let's look at the study population. So overall, they had 4,116 patients. So that's a fairly sizable study, certainly in the IVF world. Anytime you're getting past hundreds, you're doing a very good job. And when you're up into the thousands, you're doing an amazing job. So this is a pretty robust database. So the age, average age of the patients, no difference between the two groups. There was 3,517 patients that did get birth control, 599 that did not. Uh, average age 36.8 in the one group, 36.9 in the other, so no statistical difference. Uh, most of these patients were quite healthy. Their body mass index was only around 23. I guess women in Barcelona must keep their uh, body mass index fairly low. Their AMHs were in a reasonable range, 1.72 and 1.39 uh, nanograms per mil. There was a slight difference between those two uh, outcomes. So um, the group that did get OCP did have a slightly higher 
uh, AMH level. Um, the antral follicle count was higher in the uh, oral contraceptive group, but only by one egg, so not really substantially clinically different. Um, and then the fertility diagnosis was about 30% uh, female, 25% male, 11% mixed, and about 36% unexplained. And it was fairly similar in the non-birth control group. So very similar sort of numbers and, and data there for everyone to look at. So the question was really, uh, what were their outcomes like? So when they analyzed the outcomes, the first thing they looked at was, uh, what was the duration of stimulation required to get patients to the egg retrieval stage? And what they found was there was a slightly longer duration of stimulation in the group that got the oral contraceptive pills. So it's 10.1 days versus 9.25 days in the other group. So, um, did we lose sound again or can you still hear us? Because something just showed up here, sorry. So a little bit longer in the stimulation phase. The other part was that the total dosage required was higher in the birth control group than the non-birth control group by about 200 units. So roughly like half of a pen or close to two thirds of a pen of gonalef or, or pure gon or whatever you're using. Uh, so they then looked at the number of eggs that were retrieved and there was actually one one more egg in the birth control pill group than there was in the non-birth control pill group. So the group that did get the birth control pill actually produced a slightly higher number of eggs. Again, I'm not sure how clinically significant that is. The difference was between 8.9 and 7.5, but you know, it's almost one and a half eggs. So that does make a difference to some patients. In other patients, it wouldn't make a huge difference. And then uh, the other part was that they looked at the number of mature eggs. There were 7.1 in the birth control pill group and 5.9 in the non-birth control group. So again, slightly higher number of mature and same thing with uh, fertilization. They had more uh, eggs that fertilized in the birth control pill group than they did in the non-birth control group. So it, overall, it looked like you were getting more eggs, you are getting more mature eggs, and you're actually getting a higher fertilization rate. When they looked at embryos that made it to the blastocyst stage, so those are the prized embryos for us because that's the day five embryo, which is more robust, has a better chance of working. They saw that 29.2% got there in the birth control pill group, but only 11.5% in the no birth control pill group. So this is very, very impressive because you're looking at, you know, well over double, almost triple the success rate in getting to a blastocyst when you did use birth control pills. So they then measured the actual outcomes and that's obviously the part everybody wants to know about. So uh, clinical pregnancy rate, so seeing a heartbeat was 33.4% in the birth control pill group and 33.4% in the no birth control pill group. So despite the slight differences in eggs and embryos and so on and fertilization, no difference in clinical pregnancy rate. They then looked at the live birth rates and the live birth rates were 24.5% in the birth control pill group and 25.2% in the no birth control pill group. And that is, again, not any different. So no statistical significance between those two. And then they looked at the cumulative live birth rate. So this was over the two year time span, checking to see how patients did over that whole time with frozen embryos, with the fresh embryos, and in that group, they showed that there was 32.4% in the uh, birth control group and 31.6% in the non-birth control pill group. And again, there was no difference. So they then took all of the data and they wanted to make sure that these findings were correct, even when they controlled for what we call confounding factors. So your age, your body mass index, your smoking status, um, your infertility diagnosis, how much dose you took. And they really did a good job of hitting every single important target in there and even when they did that they actually showed that there was still no difference in live birth rate or cumulative live birth rate when they controlled for every single factor that they could so there was no difference between the birth control pill group or the not birth control pill group so ultimately what they concluded was based on their data 
it does not appear to have a significant impact on success rates, regardless of whether you use birth control pills or not. So for patients that need to be programmed either because of they're using a donor or they need a surrogate or we're programming them in order to schedule things better, it does not appear to have any impact when you're using this reasonably short duration of birth control pill. And we use a lot of Marvalon and another one called Brevicon, um, which falls well within the same realm as the birth control pills that were used here. And so it does not appear to have any significant impact whatsoever. In fact, there may be a suggestion that it might be even a little bit better. And when it is uh, giving you a higher egg yield and fertilization and blastocyst development, maybe if we have enough numbers and this is done prospectively, we may see some benefit. There are some things to watch out for. So there is some concern, although not good data yet, that in women that are older or over the age of 40, it may not work quite as well because you can get a little bit of a suppressive effect if you're on the birth control pill for too long. And if you're on it for too long, that can actually interfere with how you're gonna do in terms of response. And we did see that here where they took a little bit of a higher dose in that one extra day to develop the eggs. So fact or fiction, is it true that birth control pill is detrimental to your cycle? It is fiction, it is not detrimental to your cycle, at least in the average patients that are out there using a reasonably short dose or course of oral contraceptive pills and then proceeding with your fertility cycle. For patients that do get excessively suppressed by it, that's a different story and you have to individualize for some of those patients and watch them carefully. So uh, that was Factor Fiction tonight. I hope you enjoyed that part of it. 